There's an old sort of saying that the best judge is one who hates his work. A man eager to pass judgment on others, that is, is the man least capable of doing the job. Today's story is about just that sort of man, a reserved individual sent to a small village in the backcountry of a seemingly medieval country, tasked with finding out why people passing by the village are being branded as criminals, and then hanged. It's not just a story on the passing of judgment, but on the nature of those judgments we pass, and are forced to pass on each other. How eagerness for justice may lead us into injustice. Before we get to that, however, I'm extremely happy to announce that the Westside Fairy Tales has picked up its first ever sponsor. Studio Sweden makes headphones that are a perfect blend of style, sound, and affordability. They're based out of Sweden, like their name suggests, and the product they put out has all the hallmarks of what you think of when you think Swedish design. Clean lines and simple, straightforward construction that's easy to use and sounds as good as it looks. They sent me the Regent model, which is their premier on-ear headphone, and these things are great. I used them through the editing process for the episode, and I'm wearing them right now as I record and edit this. I have a giant head, and over-ear headphones don't normally work well for me. But these things are comfy as hell and still going strong on Bluetooth from when I charged them last week. The battery life is apparently rated for 24 hours or more wireless use, which I definitely believe at this point. And you can just plug them into your computer if they die or whatever, because they can run off being plugged into a headset jack with the included cord. If you've been looking for a way to support the show, and especially if you're in the market for a great set of headphones, go to studio.com and use the discount code WESTSIDE15 for 15% off on checkout. There's also a link in the description for this episode that'll take you right there, so show us and our sponsors some love and give it a click. I'd also like to tell you guys about a book you may not have heard of before, A Lesson Before Dying by Ernest J. Gaines. It follows the story of a man named Jefferson, sentenced to death for a crime he didn't commit, and the story of Grant Wiggins, a local school teacher given the task of making a man of Jefferson before his execution. Wiggins and Jefferson are both black men living in the American South during Jim Crow days, Jefferson a sort of foolish nobody caught up in a crime he wanted no part of, and Wiggins an educated man who wants nothing to do with the ignorance and indolence of his childhood home. It's a heartbreaking story that hits not just on prejudice, but how prejudicial attitudes become the ruination of the men and women they're projected upon, a theme that fits in fairly well with the story I'll tell today. For me, it most of all hit home on the topic I try to approach with my own writing, that nothing makes a man what he is so much as others telling him that's what he is. The theft of agency by those afraid you might one day use it. It's a dark, complicated novel about black and white morality, told in shades of grey. It certainly isn't for everybody, may be too much for some people to handle at times, in fact, but that can't make me recommend it any less. It's an excellent read and I highly suggest you pick it up when you get a chance. Now, without further ado, today's story, The Seventh. Bailiff Gilbert rode into Erfurt while the setting sun painted the tops of the barren oaks in red, a million scarlet fingers reaching up to the sky. His horse, a rented pony from a capital stable, shied away from the things hanging in the shadows of the trees around him. Gilbert spoke some of the odd hinterland tongue and so knew the words on the signs draped over the necks and tied to legs. Thief. Murderer. They amounted to what he'd expected, maybe six bodies in all. The Reeve had ordered him to these awful backwoods to prevent such a thing from happening. These men and women were likely outsiders, travelers, and vagrants, but they could have just as been tax collectors, merchants, or pilgrims. The good people of Erfurt didn't seem up to the task of such discernments as the Reeve had expected. The nude mutilations these peasants had visited on the bodies sickened Gilbert. Heil, called a voice from behind the crooked palisade on the road ahead. Gilbert saw villagers there, clad in filthy hooded tunics, some bare-chested and streaked with blue clay and dirt in the old way. King Igor, too, had brought the book to this land over a century ago. The pagans had found the true god at sword point and generally stuck to it, but dark times returned simple minds to dark ways. Peasants, simple tradesmen. Anybody with a hint of superstition in their blood brought out the witching poles. Deal with this, Gilbert said to Austin, one of the three dragoons the Reeve had sent along as personal guard. The man nodded, and Gilbert watched the villager who'd hailed them draw back as the massive steel-clad cavalryman brought his horse astride the gate. The villager's eyes widened, and he set his makeshift polearm, a grain scythe reforged into a cheap halberd, against the palisade, then ran off into the village. 
He returned a minute later with a shaking old man Gilbert figured to be the village elder. Austin looked back to him and gestured for him to follow. Gilbert did, riding his horse cautiously through the palisade wall. Pikes rimmed the edges of the gate like an urchin's spines, growing thickest where they'd take a rider in the throat or chest, or in the eyes. One body served as testament to the efficacy of the barbs. Wooden spikes protruded through the dead man's heart, chest, legs, and skull. Gilbert slowed to inspect the body further. Someone had hammered the skull down with a heavy mallet, leaving cup depressions in the bone. The sign around this one's neck held a word he'd never learned. Nekuratu. Gilbert sighed and followed Austin and the decrepit old man into the village. People gathered in the ring of firelight before the squat stone chapel in the square. Dirty faces peered up at him, most blonde-haired, neither green or blue-eyed. None of them dared meet his gaze, and he saw a young mother gasp when she caught sight of the nine iron bands encircling the fingers and thumb of his right hand, the marks of his true office, when he was not acting as bailiff to the reeve. We is honored for you visit, the village elder told Gilbert when they'd stabled the horses and joined the man in the town hall. The man sat in a tall-backed chair at the end of the long table, and Gilbert and his men along the rough-hewn benches. No idea you come. No planning this for. How long stay? Talk to Nekuratu. Please, use your own tongue, Gilbert said in the land's native tongue. The old man smiled wide and he laughed. Phlegm distorted his voice. You speak our language? He asked. Gilbert nodded. He'd been groomed for his job since youth and spoke every tongue in the region fluently. It wasn't hard. Most were perversions of the same old tongue his own descended from. An inquisitor is required to speak the language of the people, Gilbert replied, giving the man a nod more gracious than he deserved. The word inquisitor didn't translate to the man's language, but he understood well. All the realm did. The old man glanced at the rings on Gilbert's hand and licked his lips. My name is Folder, the old man said, wringing his hands. I am chief here and own the bakery. It is how we survive, trading our bread with the nearby villages. We are glad you're here. We've captured a Nekaratu and killed it. There were others as well. Dark things are moving in the woods. We fear God has forsaken us. Please, calm yourself, Master Folder, Gilbert said, his voice soft. God is above all things. His peace is in the heart of all his loyal children. Do you know why I'm here? Folder's eyes widened and he looked over the heavily armed men. For the remaining Nekaratu, the old man said. He is in the chapel dungeon. We will burn him tonight at midnight, according to the wisdom of the book. I am interested in your Nekaratu, Gilbert said. But I was sent here because your villagers have been murdering travelers on the King's Road. Folder gasped and made to explain himself, but Gilbert rolled his fingers on the table, producing a series of loud clicks from the rings. They grew cold in these latter days of the year. No matter what has happened here, the King's justice rules this land. I'm here to ensure your diligent faith has not led to the undue death of innocence. Inquisitor, sir, the man began. Bailiff, in this regard, Gilbert corrected. Ah, bailiff, sir, the man continued. We are simple folk, and we know justice is above our station, but we had no recourse. The Reeve holds no record of you calling for a bailiff. Ah, yes, sir. The man said, licking his lips. He had a grandfather's face, though badly worn by worry. Thick bags hung beneath his eyes. In truth, we sent several messages. Or so we thought. They were intercepted. By your Nekaratu, Gilbert predicted. The man nodded quickly. Gilbert sighed and took a long drink of the wit beer they had provided. It was strong and delicious, despite its humble making. But it held a bitterness that he only tasted long after he'd swallowed a bitterness that made him want to take another drink to clean out his mouth. What is this word, Nekaratu? Oh, it is, uh, how you say, an unclean thing, Folder said, the last two words in Gilbert's native tongue. Gilbert gave the man a look and he clarified, It is an evil thing that pretends to be folk or lives in folk. There are ways to tell. He turned his eyes again to Gilbert's rings and Gilbert nodded. A demon, then. Gilbert said. The man nodded. Of sorts. Then tell me what happened to make you think this thing was loosed in your town. What evidence do you have? Uh, well, the first sign came before harvest. 
when the blight took much of the north fields, Folder said. We, some of our farmers of weaker faith, lent money to other families to help them buy provisions for the winter. We turned the usurers out, according to the wisdom of the book. They would have died, we think, had the priest not given them shelter in the abbey. The priest? Gilbert asked. And he knew these people were usurers? Folder nodded. He told us they had erred in kindness, Folder said. Some of us were suspicious, even then, but kept our silence. But then all manner of evils came down upon the town. The fire in the square danced in the windows. The hall had no fire and was dark and cold save for that borrowed light and some oily candles. Such as? Gilbert prodded. Folder seemed hesitant. You, you saw much of what I would speak of on the way into town, he said. Men stealing from neighbors, one man killing another over a loaf of bread. Stealing is not a hanging offense, Brother Folder, Gilbert said coldly. The book teaches forgiveness and, by any measure, today's thief can be tomorrow's foot soldier. It is wartime. The land does not have men to waste. My lord, Folder stammered. Gilbert forgave the mistitling by saying nothing. These people were stealing seed grain. It's no better than setting a home on fire with the family inside. A killing by any measure. Gilbert mulled that over, but kept his silence. It was Phil Cutterson, the irrigator's boy, who told us it was an Ekaratu commanding him to steal, Folder said. We didn't believe him until we found the stolen food stashed in a hideaway north of the village. Enough for four families, but kept so animals were getting to it and half the grain all but ruined. Folder bowed his head. He was a good boy. But we hanged him. No choice, he sighed. No choice. And the others? The same! By God, the same! Stealing and hiding food away in rat holes in field and forest. And all of them said they saw a man, dark and beautiful like a woman. He came to them in their dreams and commanded them to feed him. Some said he promised rewards, others said he threatened to hurt them or their families. And we prayed, but God didn't hear us. And we know why now. You do? Gilbert asked, polishing off his mug and pouring another. Aye the old man said. We were suspicious, like I said. The sisters, they had come around to see the small folk and asked us questions, asked us what we'd seen. If we'd seen him coming amongst us in the middle of the night, if he made us strange promises or asked strange favors of us. It was the whittle boy who figured him out first, after we hanged Cuthbert for murdering Miss Vidalia. Folder, understand that I don't know these people. Oh, I'm sorry, Folder said. He poured himself another mug of beer. The Whittle boy is the youngest in the Whittle family. Doesn't have his own name yet. He said he saw the Nicaratu talking to Cuthbert the night of the murder. Cuthbert, you see, is the head of the household of Huser, as we turned out. He killed old Miss Vidalia for testifying against his family. Simple revenge, Gilbert said. Yes, Folder said. But that sort of thing wasn't in a man like Cuthbert. He was a good person, except for the money lending, but he'd never heard a fly. He wouldn't do something like that, kill an old woman alone in her home, but... But he did. And when the Whittle boy told us who he'd been talking to, we put Cuthbert through the tests, and he told us everything. You administered the tests, Gilbert said flatly. His rings drummed over the table. Is there an Inquisitor amongst you filthy plow hands I haven't met yet? Folder swallowed and looked at the table. Perhaps you have special dispensation from the church, your lordship. You're a reeve in good standing with his holiness, at least a bishop. Sir, we had no other choice, Gilbert nearly yelled, slamming his ringed hand down on the table in a fist. You put a man through hell, and he, what, told you everything? Spared a breath when you weren't drowning him to scream a list of suspects into the night? He burned, sir, Folder whispered. Gilbert's eyes narrowed. What did you say? He burned. Folder whispered again, nearly on the verge of panic. Without fire. We just held tongs to him, honest. Gilbert stormed around the table and dragged the little man out of his seat and held him up against the wall. The dragoons at the table merely turned and watched. Honest, sir. Honest. Please, God. You say he burned, Gilbert said, his fist a tight knot of filthy wool against Folder's Adam's apple. Who saw this? You? A few close friends? Do not think to lie to me, you flea. I will have this entire town flayed if you lie. The whole village, sir. 
Folder said. On God's name, we did it in the square. Cuthbert sat in Sparrow Nailer's wash basin and we burned him with cold iron. He went mad and broke Sparrow's arm. Would have run off, but we had a ring of rock salt around the basin. He said who he served and who made him do it. Then one of the sisters, God bless her soul, she ran up and threw rosemary on him. And he burned, Gilbert said, relaxing his grip. And he burned, Folder said. He burned up without a lick of flame touching him. Until all that was left was what you saw on the wall out there. We were all there, all of us, but him who did this. The Nicaratu. He said he wouldn't be part of it. Him, 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 Gilbert hissed. Spit out the name, damn you. It was Father Mark, sir, Folder said. The new priest. Gilbert stood outside the palisade by the corpse of the man Folder called Cuthbert. The dragoons stood around him in a loose circle, holding up hickory torches to give him light to work by. There was little to do, but the doing was hard enough. Gilbert reached up with his ring-covered hand and placed it on the partially exposed skull of the corpse. He felt a great heat and steam scalded his fingers. Gilbert reeled back, nearly slipping in the mucky road. The villagers, crowded in at the furthest reaches of the dragoons' torchlight, made signs against the evil eye and prayed. Gilbert thought about doing so himself. He'd never seen the rings actually burn anything like that before. It seemed impossible. Gilbert's life up until that point had been spent ensuring the king's faith was taught and practiced properly throughout the realm. No interpretations, no more or less piety than the scripture required. The book filled a hole in the lives of the common man, and he made sure that hole stayed capped and filled and safe from anything that might try to upend the order it created. He never thought any of it could be real. Not like this. He'd attended a thousand interrogations, twice as many executions, and had never once seen anything like this. He knew the signs, of course. Cold iron, salt, and clean water. Even used them himself on occasion, but they'd never turned up a thing. Commoners conjured up demons from hunger and desperation, from their trenchant need to fill banal lives with meaning. He understood the church, his own inquisition, merely as a way to disabuse these fools of their base superstitions. The mad blood rituals and theological pogroms that rendered fields fallow and tax coffers empty. The book kept people on the path, and the path led to the crown and carried gold on its back. This, this was insanity. He gripped the corpse's head again and it burned beneath his fingers. The heat cast no light but gouts of steam caught in the fire from the torches. Gilbert stood back, shaking his head. He looked over the dragoons and grabbed the smallest of them a younger man named Lucas, and dropped the ring from his thumb into the man's palm. Then he grabbed a knife and cut the ear off the dead thing. Take these and ride for the capital, Gilbert said in a low tone. Seek the magister and tell him everything you've seen and heard. If you're given a choice between dropping this foul thing on the king's road or losing your life, then die in the service of God, but burn it first. The dragoon nodded. Ride, now, and commandeer whatever you need by the warrant of my ring. Go. Lucas and his torch were long gone by the time Gilbert had organized a party to pull down the body for proper disposal. They dug a trench in the center of town and burned the corpse to ash, which took far too short a time. Gilbert knew bodies could take days to incinerate in a pit fire, but this was gone in minutes. Another sign, he knew. Then they took the ash and bone and all the dirt it touched, mixed salt with the ashes, and buried the entire mess beneath a ghostwood tree in the forest. Folder took Gilbert from hovel to hovel showing him the evidence of the crimes the hanged men and women outside the town had died for. He showed him the now-empty holes where stolen food had been stored, and the bloodstain where Cuthbert had murdered Miss Vidalia. Numbing cold crept over Gilbert as they walked. His training had prepared him for all of this, oddly enough, and the villagers marveled at how well he recognized the signs. When his rings glowed with ethereal green light over Miss Vidalia's bloodstain, they didn't hesitate to pull her entire house down and burn it to cinders on his orders. Dark had fully settled by the time Folder led him to the bent-walled stone abbey behind the church. The sisters were outside when they arrived, toiling in the herb garden despite the late hour. Folder announced their coming and all seven of the women stopped and stood and bowed their heads. They wore loose, powder-blue habits that folded into plain, triangular shapes at their brows. Some of their number threw nervous glances at Gilbert's ringed hand. Their own hands, filthy from the garden, were clasped demurely at their waists. Other than that, they were nondescript blondes that could have been the daughters of any of the women in the village. 
Perhaps a few were, but likely they were all from other villages, a precaution against the temptations of youth. Hail, Inquisitor, the oldest of them said. The straw coloring of her hair had all but faded away to cool gray. Gilbert raised his hand before her, palm down, and allowed her to kiss the rings on his hand. It was a gesture that usually made him uncomfortable, but suddenly seemed utterly practical. Her lips pressed softly against the ring over his third knuckle. The others followed suit. Sister Annalisa, the old woman called. A beautiful young woman stepped past the others, her eyes wide and terrified. Gilbert held out his hand and the woman screamed and fell back against the sisters, curling into a ball and beginning to cry. One of the dragoons stepped forward to help the woman up, and she turned and crawled into the house. Gilbert looked at the old woman. What is that woman's problem? he asked. The old woman wrung her hands. She is not well since the incident, the old woman said. He came to her in the night, before the Cuthbert man killed that poor woman. He promised her beauty if she renounced her vows and followed him. She is beautiful, Gilbert said, eyeing the woman but making no attempt to get closer to her. Fat tears welled in her eyes. She buried her face in the closest sister's skirts. He could hear her mumbling for them to protect her. The man who promises you what you already need never pay his debts, the old woman said. Gilbert snorted. And, anyways, she denied him. Her rebuke was too generous, and he took her against her will. The girl on the ground broke into sobbing and curled up around her knees like a child. She's been inconsolable ever since, and loathes the touch of any man. Gilbert looked down at the pitiful thing and crossed his arms. He knew such a reaction was not just possible, but par for the course in these situations. Raped women wanted little to do with men, and he would do more harm than good by pressing the matter, particularly to a sister of the path. The sister's gaze remained deferential, but he could see a protective glint in their eyes. This man who took her, he said. What did he look like? Dark and beautiful, the old woman quickly replied. With black hair and eyes, and a coat of stars, it is a testament to her will that she could resist such a creature. The old woman and the other sisters nodded, six heads bobbing in unison. The weeping creature on the ground kept her face in her skirts. Gilbert turned to fold her. Take me to the priest, he said. Hey, don't worry, we've got plenty of story to go, but we've got sponsors now, and that means commercials. Please pardon the interruption. As you heard at the beginning of the program, we're now sponsored by Studio Sweden, a premier headphone company that strives to make fashionable headphones that sound as good as they look. They succeed on that front, too. These headphones are simple and stylish, a mix of matte and polished steel surfaces that you'll feel great walking around in public with. I got the Regent model, their premier over-ear headphone, in black. Besides how good it sounds, what's most important to me is that it's comfortable, easily adjustable, and I can use it for long periods of time while I edit. I have a, uh, fairly large head, being six foot four, and the honest truth is that most high-end fashion headphones just don't fit me. This set is as comfortable to me as it is on my petite five foot four girlfriend, and it looks great on both of us, if I do say so myself. If you're looking for a great looking, great sounding headphone that won't break the bank, go to studio.com and grab a pair today. They also have several earbud models if you're looking for something to wear when you go to the gym or set out for a run, and if you use my discount code WESTSIDE15, you can get 15% off at checkout. Now, without further ado, the rest of today's story. Ancient iron braziers lit the dungeon beneath the chapel. And it was a dungeon, Gilbert could see. Perhaps even left over from the wondrous crusade that had brought these lands under the king's rule centuries ago. Larders of butter and barrels of beer now occupied the rusted insides of the cages, the town's collected winter stores. At the center of the space sat a massive and ancient red oak table. One glance at the rusted bolt holes near both ends of the table told Gilbert in a second how it had originally been used. He expected the villagers probably had put the steel catch bucket that was set beneath the thing to work in the village well. Wooden benches identical to the ones in the hall sat around the table. It was one of these benches that he pulled aside to place beside the thick iron bars of the single, occupied cell. It was a tiny room, with barely enough room for an average man to stand or lay. The walls seemed carved into the limestone bedrock, curved and crumbled in places where groundwater had carved the stone. Hello, Inquisitor. The man laying on the stinking straw pallet said without turning around. 
Beside the pallet lay a slop bucket, the cell's only accoutrement. You know I'm an inquisitor, Gilbert asked, feeling more cautious than usual. Of course, the man said. I can hear. And the children have been coming around to tell me how you're going to burn me. The man rolled over and Gilbert felt his heart race. He was beautiful. Classically beautiful. With coffee-colored skin and broad eyes so dark they seemed to be pools. Father Mock's dolorous expression rolled over Gilbert and he was forced to adjust himself on the bench. He cleared his throat but found himself unable to speak. He didn't know where to start. Well, the man asked. He pushed himself up, exposing the lithe contours of his naked chest. His shirt had been shredded during his arrest, it seemed, but otherwise he was unmolested. And he seemed calm, almost on the verge of a smile despite the situation. Gilbert regained himself. You are Father Mock, Gilbert asked. The man smiled. I am. The people of this village seem to believe you're a Nekaratu, Gilbert said. I have found evidence of foulness here. A tainted corpse and the marks of witchcraft. He felt back in his element. What do you say to that? Father Mock laughed so hard Gilbert's face flushed. He clenched his fist. What do you think I'd say to that? He asked. I'm not the devil. Could you please let me out of this cage now? Gilbert swallowed and looked at the door. Father Mock made a pouting face. I told you I'm not the devil. Aren't you going to let me out? I'm not a Nicaratu, either. Whatever it is these rubes accuse me of. You're accused of heresy. Of communing with dark forces, Gilbert said. Yes, accused. But what weight does that word carry? Father Mock asked. I accuse you of being the devil, Inquisitor, whatever your name is. Now hop in this cage with me. We need to be punished. Silence yourself, Gilbert said, growing angry. This is a dire situation you're in. And I'm making the best of it. Father Mock snapped. I'm surprised I'm even talking to you, actually. You know these villagers were just going to burn me outright. They even had a little trial. Folder put on his finest and stood up on Hickory Stump to denounce me. Quite the performance. Enough, Gilbert said. What these people have told me about your conduct is unseemly. And there is some darkness at work here. Darkness, yes. Mock gave him a look that made Gilbert swallow uncomfortably. Simpler questions, then, Gilbert said. Where do you hail from? When did you come to this town? We have no records of this chapel in the capital. From the north, Mock answered, looking away to study his fingernails. The parish of Dawkins on the Salt Sea. I came just before harvest on orders from the Cardinal Broom, who apparently owed the pastor here a favor. A cardinal? Broom, you say? Gilbert pulled out a booklet of parchment and a coal pen and jotted down Mock's answers. Yes, Mock replied. I never met the man, of course. How would I have? I've never set foot near the Holy See, and they're like, don't go north. Gilbert nodded. The cardinals rarely even left their quarters these days. Why were you sent here? The previous priest died, Mock explained. He was old, I am young, and I worked under a man of considerable reputation in the north. Father Oleander, if you've ever heard of him. I have not. Gilbert said, committing all Mock said to the parchment. And how did you find this village when you arrived? What was its condition? Poor, Mock said. Blight in every field, and they had taken to stealing from each other. Some were worse than others, and I believe that maybe even one man was framed in order to free up his possessions for the taking. Framed? Yes, Mock said. He likely saw him on the way into the village. Cuthbert was his name. Gilbert stopped writing and looked at Mock. Mock smiled at him, just teeth in the whites of his eyes floating in the darkness. They probably told you he burned like a demon would. Like a Nicaratu. Yes, Gilbert said, but I saw that myself. His corpse burned as well, under these. Gilbert held his ringed hand up in a partial salute. Mock threw a contemptuous glance at the iron rings and then brought his eyes to Gilbert's. His corpse burned? Mock asked. Is that how it's supposed to work? The evil lingers. Does it? What about chemicals? A witch's alchemy? What of that? Perhaps. Have you ever burned anything with your iron rings before? Mock hissed, though his face remained placid. How do you know it's supposed to work like that? 
Cold iron is formed of fire, the fire of God which sears the unclean. Did you honestly believe that line before you saw it in person? You're a man of God, aren't you? Gilbert said, affronted. You would dare impugn the scripture? The holy word made flesh. I bring peace to fools by telling them they have the slightest chance of happiness after this dreariness is over with, he replied. And if it weren't for the holy word, my father's land would be mine and my skirt-chasing brother would be serving the king as a knight or some such nonsense. But I have predilections, you know, the kind eased by vows of chastity. He grinned. What brings you to the cloth, Inquisitor? Gilbert flushed and lowered his eyes to his book. He attempted to commit these accounted heresies to the page, but only managed to make small circles with the charcoal. His mind drifted in an eddy. This father mock was twisted, whether or not some foulness had its grip on his soul. If he'd spoken like this openly, to the other villages or whomever, he would have met the Inquisition in time regardless. Gilbert made a show of scribbling a word and then flipped to the next page. I'll remind you that you're speaking to an Inquisitor, he said. Your blasphemies and iniquities will be noted. Your impurities cleansed. And who will cleanse them? Mock cooed. If I confess everything, will you hold the whip, Inquisitor? Will you lash me? Gilbert slammed his pad of parchments onto the table, cracking his charcoal pen in half in the process. He stood and Mock stood with him, sauntering closer to the bars. Do you think this is a game? Gilbert hissed. Do you know what the punishments for your insinuations are? You will die screaming. Will it be you who makes me scream, Inquisitor? Mock said. Will you burn me? Scorch this body to ash. Gilbert glanced down at where Mock's torn shirt had fallen away from his chest. Its concentration slipped and Mock thrust a hand through the cage, clenching a handful of Gilbert's cloak and dragging him into the bars. Gilbert could feel the heat from his breath. You don't think I understand the danger I'm in, you fool? Mock hissed. The man was incredibly strong for his size. Gilbert struggled to push his hands against the bars where they were pushing painfully into his lips and face. I'm never leaving this cell. Now that they put me in it, not alive, and you and yours will never leave if you don't find me guilty. Something's whipped the fools into a bloody frenzy. Let me go, or I will gut you right now, Gilbert said, pushing hard and accomplishing little. Release me. My only hope is if you sneak me out of here, Mock whispered. Take me back to the capital, to the tower. I don't care. I can't prove my innocence in this festering hole. He put his mouth beside Gilbert's ear. I'll do anything. Anything. I can keep a secret. Gilbert finally broke the man's grip. His hair and clothing must all the same. He had drawn his dagger and held it pointed at Mock. I'll have no more of your inanities, you devil, Gilbert said. I've come to a conclusion now, have we? Mock replied, fixing his own hair and resuming his seat. He slid back again into the shadows, legs crossed at the knee. You are a devil, Gilbert said, leveling the dagger. In action, if not in truth, you are a devil, and there will be an accounting. Mock sighed and rolled his eyes. He wanted to know about Cuthbert, he said. Who? Gilbert fumbled with himself. Yes, the tainted corpse. His family came to me shortly after I arrived, Mock said, again looking away from Gilbert. Blight barely touched their fields this year. Cuthbert told me that was because he was just a better farmer explaining some agrarian esoterica I won't delve into. He told me one of the townspeople, a Miss Vidalia, was spreading rumors about his family consorting with the witches to keep their fields fresh. They had experienced some vandalism and theft from their stores. I was told there were usurers, Gilbert said, again taking notes. Usurers, Mock said. They loaned grain. All farmers do that. It's an economic necessity out here. People put their word up as capital against the loan, too, not their homes or daughters or the like. It's a simple, honest system. There's nothing honest about usury, Gilbert said. God, you're a bore, Mock said. Or blasphemy, Mock rolled his eyes. In any case, I tried to mediate, Mock said. It went poorly. He killed Miss Vidalia a few days later and sought shelter in the church. I granted it to him simply to keep him from being torn limb from limb by the mob in the village square. Mock sighed. 
I turned him over to them once they calmed down enough for a civil execution, but once he died, others started going day by day. Others? Yes. Did you see them in the trees on the way in? Mark asked. The townspeople went mad with fear. They convinced themselves Cuthbert was one of their Nekaratu and put him in a bucket days after he died and performed the tests on his corpse. They decided I was in on the whole thing the next day. Why? Because of the sisters, Mark said, waving a flippant hand. They never liked me. They had their ways set long before I got here. Detested me so much after our first meeting that they refused to attend my services and prayed out in their little hutch instead. It was one of them that accused me of visiting them in their dreams. Should have heard the account. It was so lurid, I'm sure that some of them were being visited by someone at least. They are ladies of the cloth, Gilbert reminded him. So long as that cloth's not white, I suppose, Mock replied. Gilbert opened his mouth to rebuke him again and he held up his hand. Then he stood and pulled his trousers down over his left hip. Gilbert nearly shaded his eyes before he realized what he was looking at. A garish purple scar sat over top Mock's right hip bone. Nobody knows about this, by the way. Ask any of them if they've seen it. You wish for me to have a woman recount her... ravishing? If it didn't happen, then you have no cause for embarrassment, Inquisitor, Mock said. I'm surprised you're hesitant in the matter at all, given how invasive your kind likes to be. Besides, we've already alluded to my disposition. I've no interest in that sort of thing, regardless of the circumstance. Yes, even if I'm unclean, I have a preference for the uncleanliness I indulge in. You're a well-spoken devil, by any measure, Gilbert said putting the parchment and broken charcoal away before standing. I'll have the nun's stories checked, regardless. When all seven testimonies ring true, what will you argue then? I'll sow doubt into you until the last turn, Inquisitor, Mock said, though he seemed as though Gilbert's statement had given him pause. You have hard eyes, hardened eyes, but I can see beyond that. You don't want any of this. You want softness and light. You've only been talking with me so long because you love crossing swords with an equal. It's like sparring. A war of words. Why twist tongues when you can cross them, eh? He sprang at the bars again and Gilbert saw a measure of fear in his eyes, though nothing seemed to abate his confidence. Anything, Inquisitor, Mock said. I'll promise you the world, and you can make a world of me if you just open these bars. Bind me and sling me over your horse. I'll ride ass up for weeks if it means I can meet my end by a single clean stroke before a crowd of my equals. Not this dirty farmer's justice. Anything. Anything. Gilbert shook his head and walked up the stairs. The fire in the square warmed his face, forced him to shield his eyes. Shadows of people moved around it, a dance of slow feet and thickening darkness. They spoke and laughed and their nervousness floated through the air to rest on him like ash. Austin laid his armored hand on Gilbert's shoulder. He spoke levelly, but his eyes betrayed caution. They're building this fire high, he said. Too high for any purpose but one. You see there? They tore the support poles out of that house at the edge of the square to burn them. And that was after the tables and chairs and any other stick of furniture they could get their hands on. Gilbert followed Austin's eyes and saw the house already sagging, lazy from the loss of its bones. We should finish what business we have here and go. Damn the night. These people want blood. Go to the sisters, Gilbert said. Take one of them. Any one of them. Their testimony doesn't align with his. There's something wrong here. Austin leaned in closer. This is no time for testimonies, he said. Look around us. The verdict is in. Be that as it may, I need them, Gilbert said. Anyone will do. Austin hesitated and Gilbert gripped his arm. It will settle things, then we'll go. He looked around. Where is Samuel? Austin pointed to the small chapel. In there, he said, retrieving the valuable relics. No sense leaving them to this. Austin gestured around with his hand. He leapt back and pulled Gilbert with him just as a topless woman sprinted past them, grime-smeared breasts flapping in the firelight. She vanished in the darkness at the edge of the square. God's holy name, Gilbert whispered. Austin said nothing. More people had gathered beside the fire. Now a band of perfect shadow moved in carousel. 
Firelit eyes appeared as if from nothing, and Folder made his way closer to the men. Gilbert turned to Austin and whispered, Go. Anyone will do. Aye, he replied. Then he was gone. Heil, Inquisitor, Folder said. Fear of authority had fled the man's face. He spoke in a stilled, reverent tone. He seemed drunk, but not on drink. How goes the questioning? You've seen through his disguises by now. He's Nicaratu, unclean. You can see. Almost, Gilbert said, though his testimony... Lies! Always lies from the enemy. Folder staggered, eyes wide and locked with Gilbert's. He had discolored, crooked teeth, like rotten fence posts. Yes, Gilbert said. Be that as it may, his story contradicted yours. He told me he wasn't harboring a user, that Cuthbert's family had been scorned by the village. You believed him? Folder asked, shoulders swaying. He is Nekaratu, unclean. Is any of that true? Gilbert tried to impress his authority onto the man. If it is, what of it? The sisters showed us all the light. They know what he is now and know what we know, too. He won't escape justice, not here. We aren't weak. We are farmers, aye, but we aren't weak. We don't allow sin in this village. Or vice, or heresy. So what if Cuthbert wasn't a user? Should we call him by what he is? A sodomite? Ruin the man's name either way, but only one way ruins the family, too. The wife is young. She can remarry. The boys are good workers. Folder, did you bear false testimony? Gilbert asked. Chanting began around the fire. Shapes of men rolled like the smoke darting in and grabbing smoldering hunks of wood to wave about their heads. Folder's eyes burned. No false testimony, Folder hissed. No words that burn a witch are false. That's the word. We serve the word here. Folder leapt forward and grabbed Gilbert's cloak, fingers digging into the mail beneath. His breath reeked of yeast and milk, and his teeth worked in his mouth even when he wasn't speaking. He pulled Gilbert's face past his own and buried his nose in the crook of his neck, smelling him. Damn you, Gilbert said, smacking the side of the man's skull. Folder twisted and fell into the dirt. He spun in the mud like a snake and rose in a crouch. His gnarled finger jabbed at Gilbert's face. Gilbert laid his hand on his dagger. False testimony, he hissed. The smell is on you. Don't you have a nose? No words that burn a witch are false. I read, lordling. Kings have chairs in all the world, but my chair sits at the head of a hall of brothers. No false testimony. Did he touch you? Did his words touch you? No false testimony. Folder turned and stormed into the night, blending into the mass of bodies around the fire. Gilbert walked down the stairs as the folk sent up a keening wail that somehow became song. He didn't know the words or melody, but it had that ancient rhythm all old songs seemed to share. He shivered. Hi, Inquisitor, Mock said as he walked into the dungeon. He sat back in the shadows at the edge of his cell. The light from the fire outside burned brighter than the smoldering brazier. Gilbert stormed through the dank basement, upending every stick of furniture in his search for a key. He finally found it hanging from an old hangnail on a stone support beam at the center of the room. You mean to free me? Mock said that with a cheering disbelief. Gilbert looked at him. Mock's expression remained cool. His eyes tinged with a sarcastic mirth. If he wasn't the devil, he looked like him, Gilbert thought. He approached the cell. You sodomized the Cuthbert man? Gilbert asked. Mock crossed his arms. Yes, he replied plainly. Did you visit the seven sisters in the abbey as you were accused? Mock only smiled. Gilbert laid a hand on the cell bars. Did you? Who's to say? They certainly believe I did. Damn you, you arrogant fool. Gilbert said, they will tear you apart. I was ready for that before you walked in the door, Mock replied. Where was I? Maybe this is all here for you, Inquisitor. Maybe I just wanted to see another soul squirm on the hook before I yank it up out of the sea. He smiled. Unlock the door and run away with me. The nameless song outside had reached a fever pitch. Gilbert heard footsteps outside the church. 
Voices echoed into the dungeon from the stairs. He unlocked the cell door and threw it open. Mock stood, his face expressionless. A rescue? he asked with a smirk. A mercy, Gilbert replied. He laid his ringed hand around the priest's throat and those iron bands stayed cool against his flesh. With his other hand, he slid his dagger into Mock's heart. The man whispered in Gilbert's ear and then he died. His head fell forward to lie on Gilbert's shoulder and Gilbert felt his stubble scratch his cheek. Then they were on him. The bodies fell in the cage like grain, pressing into and filling every inch of space. They tore Mock away and threw Gilbert to the back of the cell. They were indistinguishable from each other in the flickering dark, and he heard only the sounds of tearing and screaming, wolves descending on a kill. Then they were gone, and Mock's body along with them. Gilbert pushed himself to his feet, shaking. He half expected them to come for him next, but they did not. Tacky blood covered the floor in a pool and trailed up off into the steps and into the night. He followed it cautiously, taking care not to step in any. Mock was no demon, but his remains felt foul to Gilbert, as though not the man himself, but his passing had made them unclean. The villagers had abandoned the fire when he stepped out of the dungeon. The smell of burning hair and meat made him sick to his stomach. Wailing in that same keening song fell out of the trees and shadows from every direction, growing fainter and fainter, as though some foul ceremony had cast the villagers back to the woods like mischievous fae, had dragged them back into the twirling black where all dark things hailed from. He called for Austin. Nothing. And nothing when he did the same for Samuel, though a few hoarse voices returned his calls with sing-song mockery from the dark at the forest's edge. Gilbert walked alone but felt watched, felt the eyes of the villagers on him, all of them as mad and flame-licked as Folder. He checked the stable for their horses and found none. He pulled his dagger and walked around the chapel, where deep boot prints had marked Austin's passing. They led to the small abbey. Gold and steel lay piled against the front wall of the building beneath smoking tapers. Gilbert recognized Samuel's breastplate among the litter. There was meat as well. Skinned horse heads and chunks of thick red muscle laid bare and shapeless on the weary grass. Sounds in the house beyond the little altar caught Gilbert's ear. He tried to walk away but readied his knife instead. He pushed the door open with the toe of his boot and the beauty he saw there stifled his breath, made him want to piss himself and scream. He dropped the knife and it stuck blade down in the doorway. He tried to walk away. He could not. Austin's naked feet shook as the wondrous darkness writhed atop him, as it took its meal and stretched its naked limbs, as it entwined itself into the roof and rooted in the hearts of the hollowed-out sisters around it, their faces yawning open and empty and dead and suckling at the abhorrence entering their noses and mouths. Scattered eyes opened on a back of thatched skin and looked into Gilbert and through him, and Gilbert thought of Mock's dying whisper, there were only six. The door swung shut behind him. That was the seventh. What did you think? Have you ever had to make a judgment like that in your life? Have you ever been forced to make a decision with severe consequences or that left you with a bad taste in your mouth? Most importantly, did you like the story? I want to hear back from you no matter how you feel about my writing, and you can get at me in a variety of ways. The easiest is just to send me a message at westsidefairytales at gmail.com, but you can also talk to me at WSFairyTales on Twitter, or at WestsideFairyTales on Facebook, Instagram, and Google+. If you like what we're doing here at the West Side Fairy Tales, take the time to support an underdog indie podcast and rate and review us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Tell your friends about us too, if you get a second. We always love adding another member to the small but growing Westside Fairy Tales family. Speaking of things we love, you should check out Gamma Radio, one of our favorite indie podcasts. It's a comedy radio show set in post-apocalyptic England. Every episode's hilarious, and they do a ton of great original music. I'll run their promo at the end of this episode so you can get a sneak peek at what they've got going on. It'll hold you over until our next episode, The Gap on Gable Street. If you've been following along with the West Side Fairy Tales very closely... This tale, about a man who possesses an uncanny attention to detail finding something rather odd out of place, is a sort of hub story, at which several other plots intersect. 
I'm really excited about getting more into the meat of this thing, and I have to say in advance that things only get stranger from here on out in the West Side Fairy Tales. If you don't want to be left out when the oddness comes round, check out our archives wherever you get your podcasts, and until then, stay safe out there. West Side Fairy Tales podcast is written, read, and produced by Tyler Bell. All content here in 2018, Tyler Bell. I'm a radio. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess. She was a princess scientist, and her name was Sarah. The town of Lower Spittal has borne witness to tragedy, death and destruction not seen on a scale since the great nostril mining scandal of 203 ABB. The architects of this latest disaster stand before you today. Uh, we're not dead. And I'm not a murderer. Yes, we are finally back on air. Uh... These two are despicably evil. Uh, we had no part in these unfortunate events. Oh, you're one of the murderers, aren't you? Which of you are the poisonous bugs in this healthy fruit salad? Are you the poetry police? He's guilty. In other news, I'm having a baby. Look at me, I'm an ancient wasteland psychopath. You're a mince brain fuck-up. Promise me you'll do the show for Carry on without me. I tried to warn you away, but you... <laughs> didn't listen, you arsehole. This is ridiculous. Since when did we all stop believing in fairy stories? <laughs> what? What? What do we do? I have the answer. <laughs> What's occurring? This dreadful conversation. Why are you mushrooms growing out of this man's head? Citizens, be warned. Beware of the blob. No need to be alarmed. It's just a dead, torn apart body. No need to panic. Holy mother of fuck. No, 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 no. I don't think you get it. It must be in Lower Speed. Bullshit. What are the lies we told you? Shall we paint his edible next? Oh, load of bollocks. It's a bloody myth. Fuck! Help me stop this thing. Our innocence is plain for all to see. Hold it! Let the trials commence. Gamma Radio, Series 2, coming soon.